I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for joining us here on Closing Arguments. And as we sit here tonight, I cannot imagine what is going through the mind, the emotions of the parents of the victims of the Michigan school shooting. I could imagine the heartache and the loss and the shock. But now, as they and we and the world is learning more about the circumstances surrounding what happened, where are those emotions going? There has to be some level of absolute anger, anger tonight. I'm here on the outside looking in and I'm feeling it. I can't imagine what it's like for the parents of those four students who lost their lives, the seven who were wounded, and the dozens and dozens of others who lived through that horrific day inside that school. And it should not have happened. It should not have happened. It could have been prevented. It should have been prevented. This is a child, 15 years old, teenager, who's in class searching for ammo. Teacher sees it and says, wait, wait, something's not right here. Right? There could be an innocent explanation for that, but the teacher did the right thing and reported it to school administrators. Nothing happened. Next day, same student, now drawing pictures of a handgun, a bullet, blood, and, and, and writing some of these phrases and words like, help me. The world is dead. My life is useless from a 15-year-old boy. Once again, the teacher did the absolute right thing, took a picture of this and reported it. It resulted in a conference. The parents are called in, school administrators there, and the 15-year-old. And you've got, okay, these two days. Now let's talk about the parents. Let's talk about the parents, because when you talk about a school shooting, there are two lines of defense that exist. One is, is the home life, the family, the parents of that child. That's one line of defense. The next line of defense is the school. And, and we see that the, the teacher is, is, is doing the right thing and upholding uh, that line. And you see something, you say something, you do something, and they did. So now we're in this conference and the school administrators are there. And you've got this evidence. She took a picture of the note. And you've got this evidence in front of you. He's searching for ammo one day. The next day he's writing down these things, drawing pictures of bullets and blood and death and, and, and guns. And the parents are there. And what else do these parents know? They know that they just bought him a gun. They bought him a gun, and they had that knowledge at that moment, at the moment where they're called down to school because the teacher is concerned and rightfully concerned. The flags are all over the place. Now, the school administrator doesn't know about the gun, but it's obvious to all of us that the, the parents had an obligation at that moment to put two and two together. For several, several reasons. Let's begin with, with the safety of your own child. Your child is saying, my life is useless. Help me. You're the parent. That's what you're supposed to do. Help your child. You know, at the end of every show here, I, I, I remind people, don't forget to hug the kids. And, and I say that. For parents, don't forget to hug your child. But, but it's not just physically hugging them. It's, it's taking care of them. And you don't do that? Your child is drawing these, these really, I mean, dangerous types of pictures, right? Oh, yeah, there always can be an innocent explanation, but you just bought him a gun. He's reaching out. He wants help, and you do nothing. You say nothing. You refuse to take him with you. You resist taking him out of school that day. And we know what happened. Normally, I, I, I don't like going down the road of blaming someone 
other than the killers, right? But in this case, there is blood on their hands. There's blood on their hands tonight. Let me show you their picture because it's important. Because right now, guess who are fugitives? You've got the sheriff. You've got the marshals. They are looking for this couple. James and Jennifer Crumbly, wanted by the law tonight because they've been charged with involuntary manslaughter. It's just not, you know, uh, the, the moral obligation they had. According to the DA, there was also a legal obligation to take some action, which they didn't do. I don't understand it. I just don't understand it. This should not have happened. And again, I can't imagine being one of those parents to any of those children that were in that school. I mean, our thoughts and prayers are, are with them, but the, the, the level of outrage because those parents didn't do what parents are supposed to do, and the school administrators let that child go back to class. You saw the pictures, searching for Amla's pictures. Come on, come on. Last night on this show, I said, I can't imagine that there was any information in front of those administrators that would raise a flag. And then today we found out this. And I was like, are, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That second line of defense, gone. Parents did nothing. As a matter of fact, they helped it. They bought the gun. Let's take a listen to the DA. The investigation into the school shooting incident at Oxford High School, which occurred on November 30th, 2021, has revealed that James Crumbly purchased a Sig Sauer 9mm model SP-2022 from Acme Shooting Goods in Oxford, Michigan on November 26, 2021. A store employee confirms that Ethan Crumbly was present with James at the time of the purchase. Per statute, James Crumbly completed ATF Form 309A, 5309A. On or about November 26, 21, Ethan Crumbly's social media posts reveal photos of the semi-automatic handgun, along with the caption, just got my new beauty today, including an emoji with hearts, Sig Sauer 9mm, any questions I will answer, end quote. Subsequent to the purchase of that weapon, one of Jennifer Crumbly's social media posts on about 11 27 21 read, quote, Mom and Sunday testing out his new Christmas present, end quote. On November 21st, 21, a teacher at the Oxford High School observed Ethan Crumbly searching ammunition on his cell phone during class and reported the same to school officials. Jennifer Crumbly was contacted via voicemail by school personnel regarding that son's inappropriate internet search. School personnel indicate they followed that voicemail up with an email but received no response from either parent. Thereafter, Jennifer Crumbly exchanged text messages about the incident with her son on that day, stating, quote, LOL, I'm not mad at you. You have to learn not to get caught, end quote. On November 30th, 21, the morning of the shooting, the next day, Ethan Crumbly's teacher came upon a note on Ethan's desk, which alarmed her to the point that she took a picture of it on her cell phone. The note contained the following. A drawing of a semi-automatic handgun pointing at the words, quote, the thoughts won't stop, help me, end quote. In another section of the note was a drawing of a bullet with the following words above that bullet, quote, blood everywhere, end quote. Between the drawing of the gun and the bullet is a drawing of a person who appears to have been shot twice and bleeding. Below that figure is a drawing of a laughing emoji. Further down the drawing are the words, quote, my life is useless, end quote. And to the night, right of that are the words, quote, the world is dead, end quote. As a result, James and Jennifer Crumbly were immediately summoned to the school. A school counselor came to the classroom and removed the shooter and brought him to the office with his backpack. Counselor obtained the drawing, but the shooter had already altered it. The drawings of the gun and the bloody figure were scratched out along with the words, help me and my life is useless. The world is dead and blood everywhere. Those were all um, altered by him. As the meeting, at the meeting, James and Jennifer Crumbly were shown the drawing and were advised that they were required to get the sh their son into counseling within 48 hours. 
both James and Jennifer Crumbly failed to ask their son if he had his gun with him or where his gun was located and failed to inspect his backpack for the presence of the gun, which he had with him. James and Jennifer Crumbly resisted the idea of then leaving the school at that time, of, of their son leaving the school at that time. Instead, James and Jennifer Crumbly left the high school without their son. He was returned to the classroom. When the news of the active shooter at Oxford High School had been made public, Jennifer Crumbly texted to her son at 11.22, I'm sorry, at 1.22 p.m., quote, Ethan, don't do it. They knew it. They knew it. It shouldn't have happened, but it did. So now our system of justice has to deal with it. Let's bring in our think tank tonight uh, to talk about that. Joining us in New York City, former senior homicide prosecutor Bernardo Villalona. In Cleveland, Ohio, criminal defense attorney Ian Friedman. And in San Diego, California, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Brian Watkins. And you can contact him, of course, at brianwatkinslaw.com. Welcome, everyone. Great to see you on this Friday night. Uh, rough story, uh, brutal story. Uh, Bernarda, I'll begin with you as a prosecutor in this case, going after these parents. Your thoughts about the case against the parents. So I have to thank this prosecutor for having the courage to bring these charges against these parents because this is truly groundbreaking because we haven't seen it anywhere in the country. At least I don't know about it. When you look at the charge, it's involuntary manslaughter. What does that mean? That's like negligent homicide. So how are these parents grossly negligent in their acts in order to aid and assist their son? Couple of things. You have to look at the totality of the circumstances. They were there in terms of the father and son when they purchased the gun. But aside from that, you have him posting on social media that look at my new baby. Then the next day, you have mom posting on social media, mom and Sunday checking out, trying out our new Christmas gift. And then aside from that, the messages that were exchanged in terms of next time you have to be more careful and not get caught. There were just too many signs in this case, and these parents did not do anything to stop this from happening, especially what upsets me the most is that when they went into the school dealing with that drawing, you see what the drawing is, you see what the allegations are, and you three are the only people in that room that know for a fact that Ethan had access to a gun because guess what? You bought a gun. And at no point did you check his book bag. Did you say I'm coming home? Did you ask him about the gun? We saw none of that. So these charges are the right charges against these parents. And I hope that we see some accountability at the end of all of this. Ian? So, you know, like you started off here today, Vinny, it's always a tragedy and it's unnecessary. I've represented, you know, unfortunately, mass school shooters for uh, since uh, 2011. And... They just keep going and going, 31 of them since August of this year. It doesn't stop. And every single time the child gets the gun from someone, and yet they never, the parents or whoever gives the gun, they're not charged. And the reason is uh, because that's just simply not enough. Now, I'm separating the person here versus you're coming to me as the defense lawyer. Absolutely. And the defense lawyer, that's right. And the defense lawyer has to reiterate what the prosecutor said. What did the parents know? And also, just as importantly, when did they know it? And I can never jump to a conclusion, nor should anyone, because we know it's two different types of thinking. The thinking outside of the courtroom and the law that causes you to think differently inside of the courtroom. When did they know it? This is going to be a very fact-specific <clears throat> case. And look, I commend the prosecutor for charging it. I certainly think there's enough there for probable cause. We're all going to have to wait and see how the facts of this case uh, really do unfold. But I also bring in one thing. I hear what you're saying, Vinny, that there shouldn't necessarily be liability with the school or you're not quick to go there. But there's a lot of overlapping behavior here that if we're going to say the parents were wrong, the, the, the staff, the school staff has that responsibility uh, as kind of that, per that parent during the day to also really take those steps uh, to make sure the students are safe. And yeah. so I think there's going to be a lot of query here, but I agree with you, absolutely unnecessary. Unfortunately, it's going to keep happening uh, because we're not changing the culture here, but this is a very fact-specific query. 
It really is. And when I look at the school, I look at the, I, I see the administration and whoever was in that conference differently than that teacher. Uh, that teacher Agreed. was doing everything, everything possible, and and even took a picture of of the note. Brian Watkins, go ahead. You know, I got to take the other side of this. All right, I think we're Monday morning quarterbacking this. Never are people prosecuted for failing to prevent an intentional act or crime by another. That's rare. That never happens. We don't know what conversation the parents <laughs> had with the child. You know, we just don't know that. We don't know. I mean, you got to look at the other side of this. Picture the headlines on the Internet. Kid expelled from school for drawing pictures. People would be outraged. You know, where, do you, where was he writing these pictures from? It may be from a, some a movie or song lyrics. And he got expelled for that. People would be up, outraged. Clearly, because of what happened, people aren't. And people are all now Monday morning quarterback in the situation saying everybody should have done something. But to be real, what parent honestly believes that their child is capable of doing what he did? Let, let me, let me, let me throw in a couple denial. extra. They uh, may be in denial. Brian Watkins, how about this? How about if the father is going after the conference is going back to the house to see if the gun is there? What if as soon as there's word out that there's a school shooting, uh, the father uh -huh. calls and says, uh, yeah, I think that's my son. How about the mom texting, don't do it, when she finds out there's, a, there's an active school shooter? It seems to me some of those acts, it was kind of in their mind that this was possible. But how about just asking your son, do you have the gun with you while you're in the office? Or asking the administrators to step out for a second if you don't want to reveal that you're buying a gun, even though you posted it on social media, and asking them, where's the gun? You don't know that that didn't happen. You don't know what the conversations between the child and the parents were. The child could have simply said, Mom, Dad, come on, you're crazy. Why would you ever even think I would do something like that? And parents want to believe that. No school shooter's parents believe like, yeah, I knew my son was going to do this and this was coming. They want to believe, and they do honestly believe, that my son or child could never do anything like what he did. And that's a real, a real belief by the parents, whether it's right or wrong. They may have truly believed that. So, and to say that, oh, don't do it. Well, that that suggests that she knew that he was going to do that and didn't do anything. And I think that's far reaching. The don't do it could have meant anything. I doubt it was referring specifically to, I'm going to kill a bunch of people in my classroom today. All right.